Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jason Klepa, along with Gabe Yanez. We will be talking to Jacob Hepner today. Now, if you don't know who Jacob Hepner is, I'm just going to read off his Instagram bio. It's super basic, simple, and it's clear to the point of why we're having him on the show today. He's a five-time CrossFit Games athlete. Crush it out there. He's a one-time boxer. If you miss his fight against Josh Bridges, it was incredible. Great way to learn a new skill and get after it. But in addition, he is the current national champion for the tactical games. He's also an entrepreneur and runs some businesses. He's an incredible human being. But in particular, what I want to talk to him about today was the tactical games. Him and I, we met out here in California. We did some training together and I just, I caught the bug. I was like, man, I want to, I want to learn more about this. And so instead of me just calling him, having more and more conversations, I figure, Hey, let's jump on a podcast. Let's learn more about what the tactical games are. So for those of you out there who are interested in the sport, you can get the exact same information that I am. So if you've been interested in doing the tactical games or interested in biathlons or any type of marksmanship combined with fitness, I think Jacob has a ton of value to add today. So if you like the episode, simple ask, share with a friend who's also interested in the tactical games or something similar, but most importantly, keep getting after it. Let's dive into a great episode with Jacob Hepner and Gabe Yanez. Let's go. So Gabe, we're... um. Well, I guess Jason too. We're, we have we live on Anchorage, and so we're building a house on it. So we live on fifty acres now. We renovated this like small two bedroom, one bath house, like an old nineteen twenty or thirty or forties house. And uh, so we're building our house on. And I, for first time in my life, get an office in my house. So I'm going to be reaching out to all you guys to get an idea of like, hey, I need a good background for for this kind of stuff instead of being like, I'm going to do it in the kitchen. <laughs> Dude, how 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 long is that process going to take for you to build your house? I've seen some of the pictures. Um. It's probably going to take over, it'll probably take um a year and like a month or a year and two months. It, 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 so we started in August. It'll probably, it'll be done by Halloween of next year is usually my goal. So we can throw a big Halloween party or something. So, Dude, Gabe, we got to go out there, man. Uh, Jacob, by the way. Uh, you just like, I, did you just invite yourself to a house yeah, party basically, at Jacob's? Well, no. <laughs> I've given it, I've invited him quite a few times. So he's going, <laughs> he's got an open invite. <laughs> so I, I did just invite myself for the Halloween party, but Jacob has invited me in the past to go out there and do some tactical games type training, which um, was one of the reasons why I want to talk to him on the podcast, because I, it's just a really big interest of mine. And we've kind of seen your evolution. My favorite thing is uh, on uh, Jacob's Instagram like profile, it says like five time CrossFit game, uh, tactical games champion, one time boxer and <laughs> undefeated, bro. <laughs> dude, dude. <laughs> Your oh yeah, your your fight against Josh Bridges was classic, man. So I gotta I gotta ask, talk to us a little bit about your transition. You know, you're out there, you got a bunch of property now. You could you could create. It's a little bit different than where I'm at. Gabe has more acreage, obviously, than I do. But um, how have you kind of evolved as an athlete? You know, and and kind of what's your journey been like? Because I'm curious, what what got you into CrossFit? Then as you got out of CrossFit competing, what made you interested in? these, you know, tactical sports. I'm just curious how that evolution has occurred. Cause I feel like I'm going through maybe something similar or a little bit, you know, what's that been yeah. like? Good question. So I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. So we actually, the funny thing is this morning, we were actually, the wife and I were talking about this morning, actually. Um, she was, she asked me a really basic question. And her question was, why haven't, cause we were talking about you actually. I was like, Hey, I'm on a podcast with Jason. We're going to, I was telling her how you're on Austin recently hanging out with a good buddy of mine, Halbert. And, um, I said, she, she asked a basic question. It was why haven't more CrossFit games athletes attempted to do what you're doing now, right? Like try a new sport like this, um, jump into tactical games. And I said, you know, I was like, um, I think it'll occur over time. I was like, but most of the men, I'll only speak, speak about the men, most of the men in the CrossFit space, you're different. We'll get that in a second. But most of the men in the CrossFit space are usually, they started CrossFit and it was hard for them. They had to learn as they went. And now they're good at it. They're at an elite level, professional level, whatever the hell you want to call it. And they're probably a little bit skeptical from starting over. There's a little bit of scariness related to being a rookie again and having to say, look, I got to start back at hollow rocks and learn how to do a hollow rock. Um, kind of perspective. And that's scary for people. Uh, and I said, the difference, how I've approached, if you've kind of followed my career, is I have always been okay trying new sports and being the worst at it for a while and then learning. Because I mean, in the grand scheme of things, 
CrossFit teaches you to learn. This is what we talked about actually two a week ago, two weeks ago in San Francisco, Jason, was CrossFit teaches you unknown and unknowable and having to adapt to certain things that you are just have never tried before, right? And trying to learn on the fly. And so our ability to just go into a sport and say, you know what? I suck at it, but I can teach myself how to do this because by golly, I taught myself how to do double unders seven years ago and I whipped myself to death for that. So it's been a fun journey, just trying something new and then finding a passion in it and now being able to be very competitive at it. Go ahead, Gabe. Yeah. How much do you think, because I agree with you, I think that there's something super tough about, you know, being a beginner again, that white belt mentality, being okay with like, hey, like I'm really good at this CrossFit thing now. Like, am I okay with going back and like, you know, being not only average, but like below average, I think it takes a yeah. very specific type of person. And that's something me and Jay talk a lot about is learning new skills and being okay with that. And the Becoming value a get. pilot, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm over halfway getting my private pilot's license. We just talked about it in our last one and man, talk about humbling, but do you think any of it does have to do with like the, the, the specifically with tactical game stuff, like the connotations of firearms? Like, do you think that plays any part of sure. people being like, you know, a little wary of going that route? Sure. I mean, yeah, c correct. So like, and this is the one issue I've had with the tactical game sport and, I, and it's not an issue with the sport, but it's something I have definitely voiced is in years past, Jason, if Jason goes to the CrossFit games or I go to the CrossFit games, we have put in the work to be there. We show up. We have minimal equipment, right? We have shoes. We have knee sleeves. We have wrist wraps, grip, tape. That's about it, right? But none of those items are probably going to fail on us and, and prevent our uh, prevent us to do well at the CrossFit yeah, Games, right? Yeah. The tactical games, the one thing that is definitely an issue that I struggled with in the beginning and still struggle with, and I think is still something that is kind of a um, – a, a, a hoop to jump through to participate is the equipment, right? Like, do I happen to own this? Do I happen to own a rifle or a pistol or we already have a plate carrier because we all have a 511 ones, right? Um, do I already happen to open own this stuff and then do I know how to operate it? And so for me, the issue has always been like the equipment for us, Jason, like I could show up in my birthday suit, they could be CrossFit games and I'll go out there and I'll compete and I'll, I'll do as well as I can. I'm not going to, I don't have to have certain things and if they, they're not going to break on me, but the tactical games is just a little bit different because of the equipment constraints it requires compared to other sports. Yeah. Gabe, was your question more in regards? Cause I think by the way, Jacob, that's a great point because here I am, I'm super interested in tactical games and I've been doing some training and I'm, I'm really excited about it, but I have a lot of questions about what type of gear you need. It's not yeah. super, um, and it's expensive. Like dude, the, the reality is, is that, you know, to get the the appropriate gear if you didn't have sponsors and whatnot it's a very expensive sport but i think gabe was your question more in regards to like the misconceptions about firearms or was it was yeah it yeah i think that yeah. there's there's definitely a stigma to it because you know i i also used to be really big in the triathlon community and man dude people spend tens of thousands of dollars on their triathlon bike but <laughs> no one's gonna put any sort of unfair judgment on you because you own a triathlon bike but there is yeah. you know a very true to stigma that like people think a certain thing about you if you own all these guns. So I think that that's definitely a difference. And I was curious your thought on that playing a part in people's kind of hesitation. You, you know, um, totally get it. I mean, gosh, how do I, how do I approach this? CrossFit in general, people are going to hate this statement, but I don't really care. CrossFit in general comes from a, 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 a somewhat conservative background. And I think people would be surprised how many of, again, I always speak from the male perspective side, but how many of us males that compete at the CrossFit games that are usually, I'm not going to say we're truly conservatively based, but like based from a perspective of, I'm not going to tell you what to do, Gabe, as long as you don't tell me what to do. And if I want to go off and my sense of freedom is I want to own a firearm. Great. Go own it. Like, and if you decide you don't want to own one, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to tell you, you have to. Um, and I think a lot of the majority of us that compete think that way. Um, heck, I know a lot of the CrossFit game male athletes probably think that way. And, um, but it's just, it becomes difficult when you deal with sponsors. And that's the thing that a lot of athletes like myself will have to kind of, and, and I understand that's, that's difficult, right? Like because of the stigmatism placed on owning a firearm heck I, tra I travel with them all the time for airports and the looks i get are like you're a mass murderer kind of perspective oh. but the, the fact of the matter is i'm just competing in it and oh by the way i teach it because the greatest thing they have to understand is the most dangerous person out there is the person who owns a firearm who doesn't know how to use it you see um 
think Texas might still do it. I'm not 100% sure. So you have to fact check me. Um, but I'm pretty sure certain states, I think like Texas actually has firearm safety courses for like junior higher element in school sometime during their, their time frame. And that's awesome, right? It teaches them, hey, this is firearm safety. It's not something to be scared of. It's something to be be prepared for and to know how to use if you're called upon it. Now, God forbid that you actually are called upon to have to use a firearm to protect yourself. That's that's never a good situation regardless, but wouldn't you rather know how to use it when the situation apprises itself? And so there's definitely a stigmatism placed upon it. If you follow me on my career, I've never really given a flying crap what people thought about me. Um, and luckily I've surrounded myself with sponsors that have also uh, understood the brand I created. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to go off and do something that is um, ill-fitting to a brand and illegal, but everything I'm going to do is going to be done right. But at the same time, it's just a firearm. And, and what I'm doing is teaching and operating it safely uh, in a safe direction and also teaching safety to others. You know, we just spent a week ago with Jason. So, yeah, I, th- I think it's a really interesting point. Like you said it, and I, I agree with you completely. Like the dangerous person is someone who does own a firearm who has not been trained like that. That to me is, is very nerve wracking. Now, if you decide not to own one, that's your decision and, and you should reserve that right. hundred percent. But if you decide to own one, you need to be trained on it. Like it's non-negotiable for me. And you need to make sure that it's in a safe environment, especially obviously around kids. Like it's not even a question. It's, it's, it's a mandatory thing. And I think what draws me to the tactical games is this idea that you're hitting another 10 component of the 10 general physical skills. So if you're listening to this and you're a CrossFitter and you're like, dude, I'm all about the, you know, CrossFit, 10 general physical skills, et cetera. But maybe I'm a little bit anti firearms, for example. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's remove the stigma. And let's talk about its, its capacity in terms of developing skill sets. So you spend your time, uh, you know, looking at power, speed, coordination, right? Uh, uh, flexibility, et cetera. But how about the um, accuracy? accuracy. The you know, I, I think- <laughs> Hey man, th- throwing a 10 pound wall ball to a 10 foot target, that's all accuracy is, okay? <laughs> and, and you know, like at the Rogue Invitational years ago, they did a biathlon. And I think that that tested a skill set. I think that initially opened my eyes to this idea of like the gamification of, of shooting and how accuracy under stress is so difficult. And, you know, you're shooting like this, like pellet through like a very small thing. And I think that what was interesting about the tactical games. And so uh, two days ago, we were in Texas and I was with Gabe and they had us do this drill. This was like a week after I was with you, where you shoot down one of those metal targets that drops, which is by the way, that's super cool because like, oh, you like, it's like very, uh, like, uh, I don't know what the feeling is. It's like, it's, it's it's emotional. it's, so they're usually um, a plate rack is what it's called. So there's kind of two different types of steel you shoot, like static, where it just you, so in the drill, you'll talk about your drill, but you thought you shot a static steel that it's made sound that you heard. And then you shot dynamic steel on the other side, it dropped, right? You shot, it, it's a fall down plate, but go ahead. Yeah. So dude, you, you start off and it was like, it was 12 rounds. So it was shoot one, run down, shoot, run down, shoot, run down, shoot. And by the time I was done, I was exhausted <laughs> and my round took one minute or like 50 seconds. And I was exhausted because I was mentally and physically taxing myself. And I left there and I was like, dude, I am, I am fired up on this because not because I'm trying to like, you know, be super pro gun or whatever. I'm just trying to utilize and develop skills. And this is a skill set that I find to be hard for me. And I want to pursue it because of that. Um, it's kind of my take on it. You know, like, I'm, I'm high energy, uh, heart rates elevated. Can you control your breath and get a shot off? And that's, 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 that's the sport for me. Yeah, yeah no, completely agree. Go ahead, Gabe. Sorry. And Jacob, I know that you've seen, cause you spent some time with, with Jason and I'm sure he was shooting, doing similar drills when you guys are in San Francisco. But for me, cause I was there more like capturing content and, and I wasn't actively participating in the drills, but to watch him, it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Like literally seeing in real time him catch the bug of like, we, I I told him this, like we got there and you can easily tell that like Jason hasn't done this a lot before, especially with the other shooters that we were there with, but we weren't there for long. We were there for like an hour, hour, 30 minutes, two hours. And by the end, for me being like an outsider looking in, like you saw them do the drill and then you saw Jason doing the drill and you couldn't really tell the difference. Like they looked equally as proficient. And I think that it was cool 
to see him pick something up like that. But I think it was a testament to the fact that anyone that trains the way that we train on a consistent basis has the foundation to be able to pick that stuff up relatively quickly and go from like being completely, you know, fish out of water to, Hey, that's, that's not bad. Maybe not expert level. Obviously that's going to take a lot of practice, but like really looking like, you know, he could hold his own. Yeah. And that's the same, the same route I went through now. Um, I get to spend a lot of time with a lot of very proficient shooters. And so when I show up with them, I quickly realize the same thing, you know, same thing how CrossFit is one of the most humbling and awesome sports that's ever existed. It's the same in the shooting industry, right? So you, you, you hang out with other people that you end up shooting with that are better than you. You quickly realize when you're at home by yourself, you're like, man, I can shoot pretty good. I'm pretty good. Then you hang out with other people and you realize, yeah, I got a lot of work to get done. Right. And, but that's the beauty of it. Right. And then you go home and you say, okay, well, I just hung out with, you know, I hung out with Jason. I learned something similar to jujitsu, right? I hung out with Jason. I learned something from him um, because he's better than me. I'm going to take that home now and I'm going to practice for myself. And then hopefully the next time I see him, I've learned, I can show him that I've showcased that I've learned something and then learn something else from him. And so all the sports, it, it goes in hand in hand for a lot of sports, but like jujitsu, one of them I've done a few times. I'm not going to pursue that. Um, but that is something where you learn. It's a humbling sport, similar CrossFit, similar to shooting. I'm like, it's, it's a lot of sports are very similar and the humbleness it teaches you every day or somebody else. So going back to Jason's original question, Jacob, how did like, tell me the story of like when you got introduced to it and how you like, okay, this is something I'm going to try and be competitive in. And then I'm also curious, like when that happened, like what was your prior like firearms experience? Yeah. Did you, you know, have shot here and there? Was that literally the first time you had touched the firearm? Really curious about that. Yeah. Good question. So I was, I, so I actually always tell the story. I was like, who was I telling the story to? Anyways, I was in a coffee shop. Every Thursday I go to a coffee shop, same coffee shop. And um, someone every now and again usually walks up and recognizes me and says, hey, Jake, you're Jacob Pepper. Can we and they sit down? We, I talk to him for as long as I feasibly can. And he was asking me a very similar question. And the response I give for leaving CrossFit and trying to try something else actually ties in to Jason. And so in 20, I think I've chose before, but in 2013, you know, 2014, my rookie year at the games, first event, swim, Jordan Troyon crushed us. Second event, Jordan Troyon sucked because he can't overhead squat, but I was in a lane next to Jason. Um, and you know, I'd been doing CrossFit for probably two years then. And so I had watched enough videos of Jason to understand who he was. And like, this is like, this is Jason Lieber, right? And we were overhead squat. We had time in between because they had a cycle through almost like 20 people to overhead squat. So it was a lot of time, downtime. Yeah. That was a cool and, event. And yeah, it was cool event. Yeah. And it was cool to watch other people lift really heavy. And I got to sit back and be like, yeah, I'm not going to lift that heavy. But um, I got to sit down, I'm gonna sit down, stand up and talk to Jason a bunch. And the one advice that Jason gave me was, hey, this is supposed to be fun, right? You need to have a good time, have a passion for what you're doing. He goes, at some point, this will turn into a job. And that's okay. Like, the, you know, it's, it was a job at that time for Jason to a degree. I was like, but as soon as you learn the passion for what you do and the drive and the fire for it, find something else, like go do something else. And I'm obviously paraphrasing that, but you know, from the wise words like that, that really hung with me and, and resonated with me. And so go ahead, Jason. Those in between overhead squat moments, bro. Yeah. yeah, let's go. Dude, but they, they stick with you. They stick with you. Um, I'm getting imparted wisdom in between overhead squatting. And um, that really stuck with me and resonated with me. And so in, um, in 2020, um, it was a weird year for a lot of various reasons. And one of them was our season. And at the end of the season, uh, I finished 11th or I don't remember. I didn't go to uh, Romus, which was top five. And um, I said, okay, I should try my hand and just see if there's something else out there. And at that time, uh, I was asked uh, like a few months after the season ended to box bridges in Dubai. And so I decided, okay, I, I can learn to box in a year. And yeah. then I, did, I had heard about this sport for a while called the tech because I had background in shooting was like, I owned a pistol. I owned a rifle. I couldn't tell you how to break it apart. Couldn't tell you how to clean it. Couldn't tell you how to shoot or hold it very well. It was pretty bad. Um, very bad, but I, I owned them. So like when I say. That's exactly, that's person, exactly where I'm at. Just, yeah. That's okay, exactly so when I say I'm like, the, like the most dangerous person is a person who didn't know how to operate it safely. That was probably to a degree. That was probably a good definition of me. Um, I'm defining myself. Right. And so 
I said, okay, well, I'm going to try this new sport. Um, it's not new. It's been around since like 2018. I'm going to try this sport called attacking games. Like I'll give it one shot. If I hate it, I'll never do it again. It's kind of like how I did a, I did a USAW meet, a USAW meet. I did one, hated it, never went back. And so I said, I'll, I'll give it one shot and started training for it. I trained for it completely wrong for like three months. Cause at that time in 2021, there wasn't a whole lot of information out there. And there wasn't people like me out there being like, just shoving content down your throat and saying, Hey, here's how you should train for this. It was just kind of like, figure it out. Like if someone told you about CrossFit via verbally and you're oh, like, yeah. go figure it out, you would have trained yeah. wrong for it. Absolutely. And so showed up to my first one in April of 2021. Man, and I I did everything wrong. The, the, the running joke in the sport is like, my scope mount is backwards. I'm not even zeroed. Like, I don't even know how to do anything. But I just kind of like showed up out of the blue and the guys that... um were competing in that event, um, helped me out. It, it reminded me of, remember the story about, you were probably there, Jason, when Annie couldn't do muscle-ups in the games in the back and people were teaching her. I, I was exactly there. what yeah. happened there. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, you were there, right? And people were helping her out. Even though you're about to go out and step on the field of play against someone, you're like, hey, I don't want to see you fail. Like, I want to see you be successful. And that happened. People were like, hey, let me help you zero your rifle. Let me help you do this. Let me, let me teach you how to operate this thing. And that's what reminded me of CrossFit there was like the community aspect of we're going to go out there and I'm going to compete against you. I'm probably going to lose. Right. But like, you're here helping me to make sure I'm better when I go out and take the field. Um, and so that really resonated with me. And I decided, okay, this is a sport that I can see myself staying in because not only like Jason mentioned, do I learn a new skill set that I was terrible at, but two, like the community really drew me in and I really liked that aspect to it. It, you know, it, it reminds me a little bit of kind of like our relationship. So obviously we've known each other for a long time, but, um, you know, at some point, maybe in the distant future, we might be at an event together. And I would say that you have been instrumental in introducing me to the tactical games. And I think you're going to be a big part of like trying to help me along this journey. Right. But you're, I think what you, what's important, I think the way you are and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, you want to compete against people and you want them to be at their best and you want to be at your best. Now you want to be able to throw down. Like you don't want to, you don't want to win because some dude has a scope on backward. Like that's not, that's not the way, that's not the kind of guy you are. Like the kind of guy you are is you want him to be able to perform at his best and you want to beat him because you're a competitor, obviously. But like, I appreciate what you've done for me just in terms of even like jumping on this podcast, because you know, there is a lot of information that I am unaware of. So you show up your first tactical games, like Talk to us about, I have a somewhat understanding of the sport, but can you just like give us like a broad strokes approach? Like yeah. what is the tactical games yeah. and what gear Easy do you day. need? Like, uh, uh, let's start there. Everyone, everyone get your pen and paper out. Um, I, dude, I got it right here in front of me. I'm ready. <laughs> He, okay. he, literally, he literally said that this podcast was going to be him just like asking how to get started in tactical game. So here yeah. we go. Well, you know, on, honestly, like, this is definitely like, obviously right now, what I represent for tactical games, as I hope a lot of people come into the sport, especially from the CrossFit side of things, right? Because there's really two people that show up to the tactical games. It's people who have a shooting background who understand fitness, but probably aren't great at it. And then there's people like you and me who show up who know fitness, but couldn't tell you the front end or the back end of a pistol kind of perspective. Um, and so it's been fun for me to come into the sport and tell the people who are fitness of like, dude, I was you a year ago or two years ago or whatever. Like you can, if I can do it, so can you. Um, so my first stack of games, um, I had a uh, leading into it and I still do it to this day. Cause you remember the, all the stuff with, um, in CrossFit right now with Roman talking trash or no Adler talking trash did Roman and the CrossFit games is here. Okay. Yeah. That's stupid. You should be able to talk trash in every sport. As long as you don't lay hands on them, everything's fair in love and war. And uh, Dude, you got to look up a guy named Gordon Ryan. He talks all kinds of crap, and it's great for the sport of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, it's, it, it sounds awesome. So I signed up for my first one. I had not been yet. I'm like three months out. And remember, I'm training completely wrong for the sport, right? I don't even care. I have, I have found the top guys in the sport followed them on Instagram and just started talking mad trash to all Like DMing them, them or what? Or are you commenting uh, publicly <laughs> or both? Comment, co both. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, those guys have, they, I think they, they knew me from 
CrossFit kind of already. And they kind of knew that, you know, I'm just here to have a good time. So one of the guys that I did that to that, that would also like, you know, um, strike back at me kind of thing was Jared Halbert, who you hung out with at, at his range in Austin. And he's just a phenomenal dude. So he was actually an owner of the tactical games at one point, phenomenal guy. And so he and I went back and forth and he obviously <laughs> wiped the floor with me and my first one, but I'm not going to stop you from talking trash, but anyway, so how the sport works in terms of like defining it is <clears throat> Let's see how, how, how should I start this? It's very similar to a biathlon, right? So a biathlon for listeners or viewers, whatever you guys are doing this, is right. We're skiing, we're cross country skiing, we're getting our heart rate up, and then we're shooting rimfire twenty two rifles on targets. And if you miss, just like rogue, there's a penalty. I think for biathlon, is it time or is it penalty lapse? Is one of the two. Yeah. And um, it's very similar the tactical game. So what we are doing is essentially pretty much that, but we're involving functional fitness. Now, why do I say functional fitness? Because you hear a lot of definitions of the sport where they say, oh, it's just CrossFit meets guns. It's it's kind of, it, it makes sense, but it's not really true. Like what we do for the fitness side of things is if Jason and Gabe, if I took you out to like Honestly, Aromas is a phenomenal example. If I took you out to Aromas and Dave's ranch and I took you out on the back patio of his gym, we're not in the gym, we're outside the gym. What would we do? Drag sleds, sandbags, run up the hill. Like we would do some like grunt work stuff, right? Because right. we don't have, we're not going to do muscle ups. We're not going to do snatches. If there's any barbell work, it's going to be a fat bar. And it's, we do non-subjective movements. What do I mean by that? Um, air squats, crap like that stuff where we have a judge that says, okay, well, did Jason open his hips? Ooh, I really don't know. Like, did he get low enough? There's no subjective movements. It's binary. It's either did Jason get that 150 pound sandbag over that yoke bar or not? Well, that's pretty easy to answer by did it get over or not? Mm. Um, we do rope climbs. That's one big gymnastics ish piece that we have added recently with full kit. Um, but the movements are very simplistic. We're talking Farmer carries, sled drag, sled pulls, um, burpees, burpees over a box, uh, anything with a sandbag you can think of, carries, stress carries over the shoulder, put it over a yoke, throw it over something, you know, drag them. <laughs> we just beat the crap out of the sandbags. Um, uh, wheelbarrow work. Remember, um, was it oh. 2014? Dude, remember? Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did your wheelbarrow fall over? Bro, my wheelbarrow broke. So this was like really young. <laughs> we did a wheelbarrow one in 2000, I think 11 in the Home Depot Center. And they had yeah. built them. Um, so they had gone the night before. So this is a this is a real yes. fact, by the way. Is So I think the wheelbarrows happened maybe a few times. I can't remember. But the time that I remember, the, the they bought them from Home Depot the night before, the day before. And this wasn't a rogue fitness thing. This was like a, a Home yeah. Depot thing. And volunteers put them together. And uh, let's just say there was a margin of error on how some of them were built. Now, <laughs> did I overload mine? Probably. Did it deserve to break? No. So it, it mine just broke and I had to go back and get another one. But anyways, I'm not bitter or anything. Hey, G- 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 Gabe, so now that I mentioned Tactical Games has... Um, Will Barrels, Jason's actually out. He's like, you know what, guys? I'm excited to end this podcast. I'm going to find a new sport. I'm out. Like, <laughs> no wheelbarrow. Like, P- PTSD with the wheelbarrow. Oh, man. Yeah. We use um, rogue sleds with the 45 pound plates as the wheel. So they're, they're oh, yeah. bomb proof in that, in that aspect. Um, anyways, that's the fitness, right? So that's all the fitness we kind of do. So, like, people define it as like CrossFit with guns. I would say that's like a 70% decent answer. Because there's a lot of movement work with guns. It that's a that's usually usually how I define it is I take you to a field. What do we do? That's pretty much like we got you're you're at a field, right? We do have a rig, so he has a rig now, so we can do a lot of things with a rig. Walk, we do a lot of climbing over walls, plyometric kind of stuff like that. But again, nothing really subjective. So that's the fitness. And how the sport works is it is fifty percent fitness and fifty percent shooting, and that's a pretty good, it changes per event from event to event. That's usually a pretty good definition of the whole weekend. So like if you go to the CrossFit games, right? How the CrossFit games should be programmed, not saying it always is, but how it should be programmed is we should look at the CrossFit pyramid, right? We should say, Hey, we got sport. We got freaking metabolic conditioning. We got weightlifting, we got nutrition. We got all these things, cardio. 
And that should be a pretty good litmus test for how the CrossFit games are programmed in terms of the pyramid. Very similar to how we do the tactical games, right? It's going to be half of it. You can get points from fitness and the other half from shooting. So how do we, how do we intermingle those is the next question. The stages. So we, we do workouts for CrossFit. Um, we do stages for the tactical games. Same as if you went to any shooting sport, you would have a stage you would run. And so the stage we would run, let's just make one up for an example, right? <clears throat> Usually I have a whiteboard behind me, but I don't. So let's just say we're out at a dirt field. We have a 150 pound sandbag and um, you just have your pistol. Your pistol is holstered on you. It's cold. There's nothing in it, no magazines. You have ammo, but it's in a magazine on your belt, okay? You're also wearing a 15-pound uh, plate carrier. Give me whatever you want, 511 Tactical. I don't care what you have. <clears throat> you got ears and you got eye pro on. Um, at the call of go, you're going to, let's say you have a 150-pound sandbag, like I said, you're going to put that over your shoulder five times. So you go one, two, three, four, five, okay? And then you're going to pick up after the fifth rep, you're going to pick it up and you're going to stress carry that sandbag 30 yards to the firing line. You then drop your sandbag at the firing line. And then in front of you, let's say it's 15 yards away, we have a paper target you're going to shoot. So now you're going to load your pistol, load, make ready. You're going to shoot on your target in front of you. I'll get to the shooting sequence in a second. So you're going to shoot the target in front of you. After your last round has been fired, if you've loaded correctly, if you know anything about firearms, your pistol should lock back, right? Your slide locks back. You're going to drop your magazine. We have a specified um, clearing procedure so that we know that everyone has clear rifle pistol. So you're going to drop your magazine for your pistol, clear your rifle. You're going to holster it. Then you're going to grab your sandbag, stress carry it 35 more yards back. And let's say now you do four sandbag over shoulder. And then you come back, stress carry it again, shoot again, stress carry three, stress carry, shoot, stress carry done, right? Let's say that's your time stops. So you have a judge working with you, Jason. You get back on your last carry. You run past the finish line. You drop your sandbag and you fall on the ground. Your judge takes your time, says, okay, Jason, you finish that in <clears throat> nine minutes. That's awesome. And then we wait for the other competitors to finish because we compete in five lanes of five or heats of five. So you have four other people could be around you in lanes. After everyone is done and the range is declared cold, we will go down range and we will, you will pull your target. Now, in this example, we only use pistol. Most of the time, it is a two-gun competition, so it is rifle and pistol. Therefore, most of the time, you're shooting rifle, then you're shooting pistol. Very similar clearing procedures. You'll walk down range, pull your target off. What the targets look like is imagine, um, I believe there are 11 by 16 pieces of paper, big pieces of paper, right? And on those white pieces of paper, we will have black shapes printed, just black outline shapes. The shapes aren't completely filled in, filled in black. I can send you a picture later if you want to get an idea. And so we are shooting inside those shapes. So let's say you have at 15 yards, let's say you have three different four inch circles, okay? Just for pistol. And so you get up there, the first round you came up there, you're gonna shoot all your first round, your first round of shooting at one circle. You just pick a circle, say this is the top one. You shoot all your rounds in that one. The next time you come back and shoot all your rounds in the second one. The next time you come back and you shoot all your rounds in the third one. When it's all completely done, that's when we pull targets and we count hits or misses inside the target. Now, next question we're going to say is, okay, well, what about how many rounds are we shooting? Like, can I just go out there and just like, you know, just start shooting like crazy? How a stage works is we have specified round counts. So they would tell you in the stage brief, just like how Boz would give a workout brief, we would go out on the field of play and they'd say, here, all the elite men are here. We're going to brief this stage. Hey, Jason, for this workout, here's the workout and here's the round count. You need to bring out three magazines and pistol and they need each of you have nine in them, nine rounds. So three mags and nine for pistol. So when you come out, they're going to shoot three or sorry, nine rounds on the first firing sequence, nine, the second, nine, the third. So when we pull that target and you hand it to the scoring table. Someone's going to go through and say, okay, I'm looking for nine shots in each circle. Um, and then I'm going to count his misses. So 27 total shots on paper. If you drop, let's say you drop three shots. It's pretty freaking good, right? That's, you know, 24 hits out of 27. So that's a good percentage. Every miss is going to be a 10 second to your raw time. So if you remember, you got nine minutes. Well, now your time, your raw time was nine. Your penalties was 30. Your total time is nine minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and that's your that's your total time. That's your time for the workout. And then it'll take everyone else's for that workout. So let's say I get up there and let's say I do it in eight minutes, right? I just go balls out and I'm going crazy on this. But what if I drop 12 shots? 
well, now I have 120 seconds of penalties, right? That's two minutes. So you were 930. I was eight minutes with two minute penalty gets me at 10. So I've lost you. And then how the scoring works is it's based upon a curve, essentially, is a good definition. So first place gets 100 points. So if you have the fastest time with your penalties added, you get 100 points. And then everyone's score is based upon a percentage of you. Oh. Remember how CrossFit, yeah, remember how CrossFit does the whole like, well, Patrick Vellner needs three people to get Bianchin, him and Matt Frazier in order for Matt Frazier to win the games. We don't got to deal with that. It's up to you. You go out there and win the darn thing, get 100 points. If you go out there and smoke us, like terribly, you might get 100 points and second place person might get like 70 points because you whooped them so badly from a percentile perspective. Oh, so, okay. So let's just say uh, the three of us were competing and Gabe takes Ooh. first, it's 100 points. I take second. Normally in CrossFit terms, it'd be like 195, 90. Um, yeah. But what you're saying is because of the, okay, so the curve-based approach, if if I got second, but he smoked us, I could potentially the de- let's just say the deviation was like two minutes and then you're like right behind me. I might get like 70 points. You might get like 68 points. Is that what you're, is yep. that the good word? Yep. It's exactly it. So you can actually, if you know a workout's for you, you can shove everyone down and just, just group them up like sandwiches. So if you go out there and let's say, what's a good workout, you'd be great at 2k row. So we, we do. So just to clarify, that the example I gave to you was a mixture of fitness and shooting. We right. do events like so. The, um, a two day competition has about six, seven to six scored events, hundred point events usually. Some, a majority of them we do are mixture of fitness and shooting. Some of them we do are only shooting, and some of them we do are only fitness, but they always complement each other. So it's like a hundred point shooting only event would be like a very like what you did. Your example you sent to me in the video you talked about where you ran back and forth. That yeah. could be like a hundred point event. And it's just like, it's very short and sweet, right? They could do another hundred point event that's fitness related. And we've done a 750 meter row for time, a 500 meter row for time, a sprint, um, max sandbags over a yoke in 90 seconds. So let's just take like a 2K. Let's say we did a 2K for time. That's something you're phenomenal at. You go out there and you know, dude, Jake can't row as hard as I can. Gabe can't keep his engine up as long as I can. So I'm going to go out there. I'm going to smoke these cats. I'm going to take a hundred points. And I'm going to shove Jacob and Gabe down to like, you know, way down the leaderboard because they are all scrunched up around the 70 percentile mark or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I, that's a cool, I mean, Gabe, I, did you know that? I didn't know that. Like, no, that's super cool interesting sport. though. And it makes a lot of sense because it eliminates yep. kind of like playing that yep. game of like, well, I'm in the lead, like coasting or just knowing that if you're in a certain place, like, okay, like this makes sense. Um, which I like because I would assume it keeps people more present in the event because you're also not like head on a swivel. What's my competition doing? You're just like, I got to get after this you. because my time matters. Yeah. 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 Which I really like. My question, uh, Jacob is, I, I guess like on a spectrum of like how heavy the loadings are whenever there's something that's loaded, like how heavy is the stuff in these events or how much are you just trying to make it? So it's like accessible for everyone. And if someone's like super, super strong, they're just going to move quicker. Solid question. That's it's, it's a good lead into the next conversation. And that conversation deals with divisions. So we have, and then we can, we can talk about gear after that. Cause I know if we don't answer gear, Jason's just going to call me after this call and be like, yo, 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 yo what do yeah. I need? <laughs> you know what? Dude, this, this episode it's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, this episode is basically I want to know, and I figure we should record this because yep, other dude. people are definitely asking the same question. A- absolutely. Send it to I'm me also very the... curious. That's yeah, why I'm asking uh, the, how heavy is it going to be? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll get that in a second, but I'm actually going to give you like Nick and all the, the guys who own it because they will, this is going to be a really good something for someone to listen to, to realize, Ooh, I'm just like Jason, but I'm like, I don't want to ask the, you know, cause people get scared about asking dumb questions. Like, no, this is a dumb question. If you don't know what you don't know, ask. And some people don't do that though. Anyways, let's talk about it. So division wise, and then I'll get into gear. You're asking a division question, Gabe. And so we have um, three different divisions. Well, technically we have four, I guess. We have masters. Um, for us, masters are 40 plus, not 35 plus compared to CrossFit. Oh, okay. Damn. Um, it's not one. Yeah, dude. You're with me, son, for a while. So get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Too young, so, Jay. Too young. Oh, damn. <laughs> So we have masters. Okay. That's 40 plus. And they have like 40 and they split them in 10 year increments. Cause we don't have, it's not like CrossFit where like we have oodles and, you know, we have like three to 400 people to show up to an event, but it's not like 
thousands of people where you need to make five-year increments for people. So I think it's 10-year increments, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 plus. <clears throat> the other divisions we have are intermediate, tactical, and the elite, okay? Elites being your RX division. I would say it's like your RX plus, intermediate, I'm sorry, tactical would be like your RX, and intermediate will be your scale division if you want to compare it back to CrossFit. The beauty of how they do divisions is we shoot the exact same targets. Nothing we do. So if you gave, if you came to me and said, um, like, how should I choose a division? Like, I don't know which division to choose. It's always based upon fitness. And that's I actually really like that because it takes out multiple variables. So it's not two variables of like, well, Gabe, how do you shoot? And how do you do fitness? Like it's only Gabe, how do you do fitness? And so if you came to me and said, well, Hey Jake, like I normally do RX workouts in the gym. I'd say, yeah. Okay. If you can pick up, if I told you, Hey Gabe, in a minute, can you pick up a 150 pound sandbag on your shoulder five times? And you were like, heck yeah, I can. I'd be like, do elite. Um, and so how the divisions work is intermediates scaled. It's going to be pretty darn light. Um, anyone in this call would, would not enjoy yourself there. Um, the tactical division in the middle was created actually last year, mainly because we would have law enforcement officers that would show up and they'd have to make a decision between intermediate and elite. And the problem that we were, they were coming into was they would, you know, they want to choose intermediate. They're going to choose elite, right? Because they want to be like, oh yeah, I win elite, right? But the problem is they get kind of beat up physically. And then on Monday, they got to go back out and get a squad car and go be with their buddies. And it was just, it was too much. And so they made the tactical division. Doesn't mean you have to be LE. Doesn't mean you have to be mill. It's just a division. I'm open to anybody. But they made that division for that specific reason for the fitness, but also they allowed you to run a red dot because what they found was lots of law enforcement officers run red dots on their pistols. At that time, we didn't allow red dots for the elite division. And it didn't make any sense for us to say, hey, Jason, you're a law enforcement officer. You might, your duty pistol might have a red dot, but I want you to take it off for this competition and put it back on. It's stupid. Use what you use on duty and then don't change it just for a stupid sport. And so they made the tactical division for that very reason. And then, of course, the elite division is just the heaviest weight um, and uh, the shooting is the same as the rest of them. Now, in terms of like weight, it's not like it's nothing like CrossFit. It's not going to be like, we're never going to hit unless they change it up this year. Like we're never going to do like a, a, there's never a strength, you know, like, um, like a strength ladder of some kind, like last year at nationals, the heaviest thing we had to pick up, which was heavy was we had to put a 300 pound sandbag over a yoke in the middle of a workout. It was at the heavy. very end. A 300 yeah, pound sandbag. Did it have yeah. is there anything on it? Hmm? Did it have like any type of like gripping mechanism on it? It's just a rogue sandbag. Just rogue. No, just, just, just what they use the games. James, Dude. Jason's into it now. Yeah. Dude, you, it's so the only thing we've done, load, we've done so far is, <laughs> the only thing we've done that's very heavy is sandbags. Now, how that was situated was at the end of a workout. So it'd be very similar to like our CrossFit perspective of like 150 wall balls, 90 double unders, 30 muscles, right? Like if you get there, you're going to try some. The 300 pound sandbag wasn't in the beginning of the workout where everyone just stared yeah. at it. It was at the very, very end. And the only person that got there was me. And the only person that lifted over was me because you had to, you had to do a lot of endurance work on heavier sandbags, like 200s, 250s to get to the 300. So it was like at the end. Um, got it. That's so it's a heavy it's, sandbag, dude. That's it's, it's a heavy sandbag. So we, we work a lot in sandbags. And then the only other really heavy thing we'll do is we'll do, we'll do some pretty heavy farmer carries because it obviously is, taxes the grip. And then I have to go grab a rifle or grab a pistol. And that just like, <laughs> it's terrible. So. So, so let's, um, you know, one of the things that I was working the other day with, um, the gentleman you're talking about from the tactical games, actually, uh, Nick and Jared and yeah, Jared was, um, the, the safety procedures and, you know, Tim Kennedy was there and he was a little, I don't want to say he was, he didn't love the, the safety procedures in the sense of like, from a tactical perspective, like he didn't like it from like a tactical perspective, like dr dry firing, et cetera, but he understood from a safety perspective. So just to kind of reiterate let's just say it was nine rounds on your ninth round. Um, the slide would stay back. You would then mm -hmm. release the magazine, release the slide. Oh, and then essentially you would dry fire. It was, was what we were going over with, um, with the guys of, Oh, Oh, he's, he's, he's pulling it. He's, yeah. <laughs> We have visuals. Out. Are you we trying to use a visual? Is oh, that what this is? Yeah, we're doing a visual, yeah. dude. We're doing a visual with you, dude. Okay. All right. So you got pistol, right? She's clear. All right. So this is the this first is just... breath on the podcast, Gabe. 
<laughs> okay, so got a Smith and Wesson pistol here, just that sitting on top of the fridge in the house. If you come to my house, you'll see it. Um, so how how, how would we do? And this is the same perspective for pistol and for rifle, right? For the tactical games. And so, if I have loaded, and this is a big if. If I have loaded correctly, right? Let's use our example of nine, right? Our example was we shot three mags of nine, right? So I have three of these babies. They came with nine rounds. On the last round of my shooting iteration, what's going to happen? If I found it correctly, I should hit slide lock, right? So I hit slide lock, and hypothetically, I should have a mag in I should have a mag in the gun, but I've hit slide lock. <clears throat> what's going to happen is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my magazine. So I'm yep. pointed down range still in a safe direction. I'm going to hit my my mag release. I drop you my magazine. We don't. Yeah, yeah, you drop on the ground. We don't retain mags. Some some stages we do if we don't come back, but if we keep coming back and forth, we don't retain them. So again, imagine this is empty, but drops on the ground, right? I still have a pistol. It's still uh, in slide lock. Uh, I am now going to send the slide forward, whether you decide to come over the top of it and go like this, or whether you have a slide release, it doesn't really matter to me. So I'm going to send the pistol forward. Um, you're then going to point down range um, in a safe direction, and you're just going to pull the trigger, Okay. And you should hear the click, or if you have a 1911 or 2011, you can see the hammer drop, right? And so now we've declared that this pistol is mechanically cold, right? It's a stick. It, there's nothing in here. We already we already cleared it. And now you're going to holster it. So after you holster the pistol in your holster, um, then you're going to raise your hand, say clear. You have a judge next to you. They're like, yep, you're good. And then you can turn around and do whatever you want. They're going to, what they don't want is you to turn around before this thing is in the holster. Um, our pistols are always going to be in our holster. Um I don't have a rifle in the house <laughs> or I would show you, um, but the rifle is the same perspective, right? So obviously for a pistol, we have a slide for a rifle. What is the thing that reciprocates back and forth that moves the, the bullet in? That's the bolt, right? And so what's going to happen for a rifle is if I've shot my last round, I will hit bolt lock, right? So the bolt will lock in the rear. And so it'll look very similar to this. The first thing I'm going to do just like a pistol is what? Yeah. Release the magazine. Yeah. Yep, the, correct. The, so I'm gonna drop the magazine feed, on the ground. Right? Yeah. Release source. Exactly the same. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the magazine on the ground. It's gonna lay on the ground. I don't care about it. I'm gonna send my bolt forward, hitting my bolt release. Okay. So bolt goes forward, just the same as a pistol. And then I'm gonna point in the safe direction, down range, pull the trigger. Okay. Gun goes click, doesn't shoot. And then I'm gonna actually now the rifle's different. We don't compete with our rifles on ourselves anymore. Um, so we actually have little boxes next to our lanes where we lay our rifle facing down range in a safe direction. It's just laying on the ground. So we lay them back down the ground and we're good to go. And then usually when we shoot, we always shoot firing sequence of rifle first, then pistol. So for that example, we came up with, you would run in, you know, load your rifle. Let's say it was nine rounds. Again, load your rifle, shoot your nine rounds of rifle on target, clear your rifle. Like we just talked about, lay it down, then draw your pistol, load and make ready nine shots on target then clear your pistol, like we talked about, holster it, clear, and then you go back to work where this, like we are example, you pick up your sandbag, you know, stress carry 35 yards, and then perform more sandbags over uh, sandbags over the shoulder. So it's a it's a really simple clearing procedure. The reason they do it is because you don't want to, like, you don't want to go with a hot gun, like ever. Um, from Tim's perspective, he's obviously coming from the tactical side. Um, the tactical games... The name is kind of like, the name is already stuck, but the tactical games are not tactical. The tactical games are a sport. Uh, I don't know how much competition shooting Tim does, but that clearing procedure is pretty much unanimous across the board for most shooting competitions. Yeah. And so and you have to like, make sure. He oh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I was sure. Yeah. He just, it he makes wanted, sense. It, it makes sense. Right. He just like, he couldn't, I mean, just when they were showing it to him, you could tell like, he's like, oh, like it was just different for him. Right. Because yeah, sure. but it's very specific. And I think that at the, at the end of the day, you know, talking to Nick, like obviously it goes out saying like safety is non-negotiable. Like it's not like a gray area here. Like there, there is rules. And if you do not abide by them immediately, you're, you're, you're out of the competition. Like yep. There's zero room for negotiation here. And I, I think that's obviously important as a competitor. You know, I'd want to know that everybody around me is taking my safety and their safety just as seriously, you know, like. Yep. And, and every competition, there's always, I don't think the last one I went to, there was any, but every competition is usually one. There's usually one person that, that shows up that just, you know, um, 
and I get it. It's a, it's a game, right? So like you're on the clock. So like you obviously want to clear your rifle, clear your pistol and you don't like take your time, but like that's a safety procedure. Like you need to get it done. And if you people forget or do it wrong, or, you know, we've seen people just turn around with a pistol. Like I, ha I haven't seen it, but like it definitely happens. Stuff like that happens. And in that case, like you're just going to become a volunteer for the rest of the weekend pretty much, or just go home. It doesn't really matter. But like, and no one's ever going to be like, yell at you and but everyone when you do it you kind of know like okay like no one's gonna scream at you no one's gonna yell at you we want you to come back but we just have to understand that i have to keep jason's and game safety in mind now the question that the next question you might have is like okay jacob well what happens if let's say um there are certain pistols um well let's say you don't even check your bolt for your rifle right because when a pistol reaches slide lock when a pistol pistol reaches slide lock it's pretty obvious. That's obvious. Yeah. It reaches slide lock because I'm also also shooting it. I can see it locked back. Bolt and a rifle, obviously a little bit different, right? You know, it's not like easily accessible to the eyes that the bolt is locked to the rear. And so what happens if let's say you think it's locked to the rear, you don't physically check it. Let's say you drop your magazine for your rifle, falls to the ground, but you still have one in the chamber and then you pull the trigger and, and you shoot around. Right. That's the whole reason we have the safety procedure. You're fine. Like, I mean, if you're safely pointed down range at your target and you pull the trigger and it goes bang, you're good. Now, as long as you're not pointing your rifle and pistol, like right in front of the ground, like 10 foot in front of you, and it goes out on your target, that's the reason we have the safety procedure. And so you're good. You're, we're not going to kick you out. You're fine. But that's why we have it. Um, that's happened. It's happened a few times for sure. Um, and that's just from it's a little bit careless. I'm not going to lie to you, but that's the reason we have that safety procedure is for that reason. Makes a lot of sense. One question I, I had going back a little bit to what you were saying before, Jacob, when you were getting started and in that transition, you kept saying that you were training for this all wrong. What did that look like? And what would like from a broad scope, like what is training for it the correct way look like now? Yeah. So, um, again, if I told you how to, if I was like, Hey man, Gabe, I'm going to describe what the CrossFit games are, and you're going to go train for it. You're probably going to do it wrong. My understanding of it, because there wasn't a whole lot of media and, and content out there at the time. This is like 2020. They've gotten a lot better since then. Um, <clears throat> my understanding was I compared it to other shooting sports like USPSA, right? So USPSA is like, just take, for instance, what Jason did, right? You watched him, right? So he's on, he's on a shot timer. Probably the first time you used a shot timer before. He's on a shot timer. Draws his pistol, shoots Beep. down on the steel, runs the next position, Beep. shoots. It's fast, right? We're talking like super fast stages, less than a minute. Very, um, if it was CrossFit, very anaerobic work, right? That's not how we shoot for the tactical games. Because like I mentioned, Gabe, you're already physically stressed to a degree. And now you're trying to take accurate rounds on target. Let's say it's that circle we talked about, that three to four inch circle at 15 yards for a pistol. Okay, if your heart rate is spiked, right, that's a little bit of a more difficult shot. Now, you might go out there and just be like, just start shooting really, really quickly because you're like, I just want to get this done with. And that's penalty, 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 penalty. And at the end, if you're like, I'm going to add 200 seconds, right, then your time just sucks overall. So really the way to train for it correctly is there's definitely a time and a place for USPSA and fast shooting. We do have shooting only stages, like what kind of like what Jason did, where those are exactly stages that we will run. But legitimately, almost the same thing. But in terms of like the the event and like most of the points, most of the points for an overall weekend can be found in the conglomeration mixture of fitness and shooting for 100 point stages where we have to shoot under duress, but we have to kind of stay. Um, we have this, our fitness has to be able to like, like my best definition is like 85%. You're not going to see me go over 85% of fitness because if I do and my heart rate spikes, I'm not going to hit anything. So I want to shoot 85% and I want to fitness at 85%. And I wasn't training that. Instead, I was training fast shooting, 100% bigger targets. Whereas we are shooting like smaller targets, you're tired. How do you shoot correctly? And then how do you take your time? Because you'll find like, I've done this just almost every competition. You'll get out there and you'll get into a cadence of shooting and you'll be feeling really, really good. And then you'll have, you'll, you'll, you'll start speeding up and you realize you start dropping them. You need to take finger off trigger index and take a second and be like, you know what? I'm going to take a second. I need to take a couple deep breaths before I get back to shooting. That's not something you're ever going to see in USPSA, three gun, two gun, any of that perspective, right? That's only inherently like something that we would do or something you would also maybe see in like a PRS, um, precision long range shooting. 
where we value the hits on target, you can't essentially out fitness your misses is kind of the goal. Man, this is fascinating stuff. I love it. I, so I love, which one, I which one's Jason signing up for? Let's get him to commit to it on, on, on the podcast right dude, now dude. on the call. Well, we yeah. don't know what the 2024 schedule was. I was talking to Nick about this. Nick, so as soon Nick as it comes out. That, Nick should, I think, have that schedule. I think he probably told you the same thing, probably early October. So how that works is he has to go find the ranges, right? Like, you know, imagine like, imagine Jason, you own a range, okay? You own a range in California. You're like one of 10. You own a range in California and Nick calls you and says, hey man, I want to do a competition there. And a lot of ranges will rent out, right? They'll rent out their spaces to have competitions come in. But now imagine this guy named Nick calls you and says, we're also going to be running around with guns doing fitness, right? It's a little bit for most people that run ranges. It's like, oh, like, no, on. thank you. Like, what are we? Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. right. So yeah. he has to find. Make, yeah, so he has to find good fits for ranges. He has a lot of good fits, and usually he has some good ranges. He kind of cycles through throughout the whole year. Like I've been to a, a couple ranges a few times now. He always goes to the same place every year, but then he always adds some new ones in and kind of cycles around because he has to make sure he hits the broader continental United States, right? He, he does a lot of them kind of like in the East coast and the central location of the United States. The West coast is hard only because California, we're not going to go into California anytime soon. And it's sometimes very hard to get ranges in Oregon. So he should be releasing the schedule. I would imagine sometime in October. And then, um, but I think Gabe, you just need to nail down Jason saying, I am going to do one. We're just going to have to pick one. Yeah, no, I'm I'm doing I, I'm gonna do one. I'm gonna do I Let's need to go. go. There I, it is. Sign it. Here, I'm gonna here, do need one. a knife, cut cut it <laughs> yeah, in yeah, blood. But, but, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I'm actually look, uh, you know, I'm gonna be trying to find some sponsors to help out with some of the equipment because it is pretty, you know, pricey. Um so well, I think that's that's the last question that we 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 didn't yeah, touch here. on. I know we're getting when Let's getting to the hour, but what is like you like what do you need at the most basic oh, yeah. level yeah. to train and show up for and show up with. Yeah. So I, I've got time so we can go a little over. You're good. Um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and get some shoot guns and shoot, and shoot guns. Um, <laughs> so gear wise, this is usually my biggest recommendation to people. Unless you know, unless look, we take Jason as an example, unless Jason knows, man, I'm in this. Like I, I love this. I want to continue to compete in this. What I usually tell people is use what you have, meaning you probably, I mean, I don't think you own a rifle, so you need to get one, but like you usually ha already have a pistol. It could be just like a regular Glock or, you know, what we talked about, like your Smith and Wesson, you might use in your house, right? Or for, if you're a copper Ellie, like your, your duty pistol, that's fine. Use what you have, show up and get comfortable using what you use in a day in and day out basis, which you don't want is someone showing up and being like, well, I'm going to go buy the most expensive pistol on the market. Um, and I'm going to go compete with that. I may not like it. So it's a waste of money possibly, but then also gets really comfortable shooting a very expensive Ferrari and doesn't actually train on their day, their, their day-to-day -day carry or their day-to-day -day car. They would drive in a day in a day out basis kind of perspective. And so use what you have. So what do you need from a minimal perspective, right? Um, pistol nine millimeter, preferably um, five mags for the pistol that preferably at least hold 15, um, 15 plus one. Um, the pistol could be iron sight. Unless you're in California. Unless you're in California. And, and, and that's okay, Jason. Like you can, here's the deal though. You can show up with more mags. So like, let's say for instance, like we had the example I gave you, let's say it was three mags at 15 instead of three mags at nine. And you can't own those. You can show up with more magazines to just get you to that number you need, right? That's fine. You have to count in your head, right? Because you're not going to reach slide lock sometimes, right? Right. But like you have to count in your head, but that's okay. We've had people do that before. Um, or, you know, we have an awesome community like we talked about. If you're like, yo, I don't, I can't own three, three by 15 mags, but someone who's from a better state like <clears throat> Kansas can then they can show up in this loan it out to you for the weekend. That's totally fine. People do that all the time. Um, so five mags, five mags for pistol and for rifle. Um, the rifle, 
I, you don't need to have them all 30 round mags. Um, you can have, a, I, I show up with usually mostly 20 round mags and then a couple thirties. Sometimes if we have a longer stage, we'll have, we'll have a 30 for like a running gun, but like most of the time we're shooting less than 20 rounds. So I show up with smaller 20 round magazines. Some, I mean, honestly, I show up with tens too. California compliant magazines. I have a lot of those. Um, rifle perspective. Let me finish up pistol though. Pistol. Uh, irons is if you're going to do elite, which you are, we have to shoot irons for right now. I would imagine by next season, which our season ends in November when nationals is by next season, I bet you we can shoot red dot. Um, so, but you can make that choice. You can shoot irons or red dot. It's totally up to you. Um, but you'll be allowed to shoot red dot if you should choose for a rifle, uh, two, two, three, right. An AR 15 platform. You can shoot a different platform if you want to, but most guys shoot AR 15. Um, <clears throat> you optic wise, you're going to want, uh, they call it L an LVPO, which stands for low variable power, low variable powered optic. It's essentially what you see, like, wish I have one in here. Crap. Those LVPOs are the magnifications that go from one to another number. So the one, so on a magnification spectrum, one is going to be no magnification, right? It's not 0.5 like your phone and it's not 2x. It's just like you looking like this is one. You have no magnification right now. So one is just like you see, you're looking through a scope. There's no magnification on it. And then it will go up to another number. Like for instance, mine is a one by 10 from Vortex. And so it goes up to a 10 magnification, but it goes down to a one. The reason we use LVPOs like a one to six or a one to eight or a one to 10 is because we can only run one optic on our rifle. So we can't run like an offset optic. Like you've seen people can actually you saw mine, Jason, yeah, where I ran a red right. dot on the side. Yeah. Right. I can't compete with that. Um so it I have a one by on this. Yeah. It looks it cool. like John Wick. Um, they might yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah John Wick has definitely had probably some cooler guns than me, but yeah he probably shoots it better. But we can only run one optic on our gun. So we need an optic that essentially is universal, can do it all. So a, like a one by six, one by eight, one by 10, that can do it all. Why? If we have to run a stage like where we have to shoot really fast on paper, and it's really close, like maybe five foot away. I don't want to have magnification out to a 10. I'd be like, what am I looking at, right? I want to just be able to look through my scope and have a one by and just see it and shoot. But then we also shoot out to 400 yards on steel. So I want to have that magnification to be able to crank up, to be able to see my hits and see my target. So that's why a lot of us um, treat the LVPO as like the go-to optic for um, for the tactical game. So that's your rifle. Um, you can get into depth of like the length of your rifle. You're limited in California. I have a 16 inch barrel. Um, I can I can send you offline. The company I use is out of Utah. They have a, a great rifle that I've competed with the whole year, Cobalt. Um, um, but it, it, like AR 15s, like Legos, like you can mix and match and grab different parts from all over the place and you put it together and make an ugly Frankenstein, but it'll work most of the time. Um, any questions on pistol or rifle before I go into the rest of it? No, I mean, I think that at a high level, that makes sense. Use what you have. Try not to you know, use what you have. I, yeah. I love that. Um, I, I actually have a heart out, but I'm going to let you two finish. So please, yep. you know, and then I'll catch the rest of this, but I appreciate you guys. It's been awesome. Jacob. Thank you, man. See you again. All right. Anytime, man. Yeah, so we got the, we got the rifle, we got the pistol and then you need a mm -hmm. plate carrier, obviously eyes, ears. And is mm -hmm. that it? Yes. And then a belt. Right. And so, and then you have miscellaneous equipment that goes along with it. Right. So plate carrier wise, um, I believe girls are 10 pounds, but us guys are 15. So we're less than our prototypical 20 that we would run for CrossFit, right? Now, when you add all the gear on top of it, like magazines, it's probably 25. Um, but you need a 15 pound plate carrier. It could be anything. Um, it doesn't have to be bulletproof or any that kind of stuff. It could no. just be a, it could be a, you know, rogue fitness plate carrier. Yeah. Absolutely. No ballistic, no ballistics required for like, remember, um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories I tell. Remember, Murph was 2015. First we did Murph. Yeah. That's when they handed out the 511 vest. Yeah. I remember Dave briefing us and going like, these are not ballistically related plates. Do not go rob a bank with this plate carrier later. Yeah. I remember him telling that. <laughs> yeah. On the Rogue Fitness uh, website, it's like you get these plates. And it's like, these are not made for, you know, these are not ballistic plates. It's like super clear. Um, dude, I, you know, when I'm, when I'm listening to like what you're going over and this idea of you know, biathlon, I don't know when the biathlon was created, but I imagine it's been many, 
many, many years. I, I mean, like yeah. hundreds. And it, it's it's interesting to me because something with such a legacy, this is essentially an evolution of an of a biathlon. If you're asking me, it's an evolution yeah. of the fitness component where it's testing more skills. It's the evolution of you know type of firearms incorporated and. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I like the idea of removing the judge judging issues. I wrote that down. I like the idea of stages. You know, I think you did a good job discussing kind of like the overall scheme of it. And like, I think for me, for anyone who's on the fence of trying this, like if you're interested, you should try new things. Like, I think it's so important as we get older to explore new skills. Like Gabe right now is becoming a pilot. You know, I've been, ex you know, exposing myself to new training, whether it's through martial arts or this, but like, I want to be a, I want to be a learner for the rest of my life. I want to constantly be developing new skills. And that's one of the reasons why I love jujitsu, but this is just another way to apply it. So I think if you're finding yourself constantly in the gym, doing things that get you outside the gym are just going to continue to inspire you to do more things in the gym, right? Cause you can be able to see that expression, right? Like you and I were able to pick up certain things because we've been training so hard. Right. And, um, did you get me fired up about this stuff? And I hope that anybody who's interested in the tactical games can can listen to this and get some value from it because you know i sh i surely have like especially like the point system i had no idea it was like that dude and maybe i could have read more on the website but at first glance i had no idea so so i actually had a funny thing is i had a i talked to you, I hung with you in san francisco talked a bunch of, we talked like an hour about this right and then i was on a call two days ago for like 30 minutes with uh spencer panchik Spencer's oh, oh. Hi highly oh, interested joke. too. And so I was talking to him also. And, and I told him the same thing. I'm like, dude, we, I was like, Spencer, we can sit here, talk about this. You and I can sit here and talk about this for an hour. I was like, well, that's like CrossFit. Like we can sit, I can sit here and define the sport to you forever. And you'll, you'll never really click until you just literally try one. And I, and I told him the same thing I told you in San Francisco. And I'll reiterate it again. As I was like, Hey, just find like two days in the fall or next spring or whatever, you know, hopefully not in our winter here and come out here, spend a couple of days with me. I have all, you don't even need to bring anything. I have all the gear you're ever going to need for three or four people and we'll outfit you. I'll teach, we'll shoot and you'll, you'll, it'll click and you'll, you'll understand you're like, Oh, okay. I understand how to do this now. And so they have the tackle games does a pretty good job at providing those things. They're called skirmishes. They're essentially like, on-ramp courses for CrossFit in your CrossFit affiliate. They call them skirmishes. Um, those are all over the place. They're in Texas for sure. But like guys like you and Spencer, I'm like, dude, come out here. You spend a whole day with me, just you and me, and maybe Spencer at the same time. And we can just teach. I can show you. And then you'll be, when you go to your first one, you'll be like, I understand this. I'm not like trying to figure out on the fly kind of perspective. Well, dude, as part of this podcast, you know, it's really important to me to share with people like what I'm going through in my life, whether it's from business, family, fitness, mainly lately, it's been a lot more like, you know, dad and mm -hmm. fitness related, but this is something I'm going through. This is me. If you're listening to this, you know, if you're, if you're a fan of the podcast, like this is me ex exploring this. And then you're going to see six months from now, I'll be out at Hepner's barn or I'll be competing. You're like, ah, I remember that podcast six months ago. Nothing happens overnight, right? You just got to keep kind of putting in the work. So brother, I, I appreciate you. I want to be sensitive every time. I want to let you get out into the range to go crush it. But, uh, dude, I think, you know, a lot of people are going to get a lot of value from this. I'll make sure to, you know, put in the uh, podcast show notes, the, the links to, you know, your different websites. You're always crushing it on IG and just, uh, I appreciate you, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, man. I'll be, I know I'll be back on again. So <laughs> let's do it again.